Okay, thank you. So I'll be talking about a project to create a table of elliptic curves over Q square root of 5. And just as a little background, um, there's another table of elliptic curves over Q that Cremona has, uh, John Cremona has been working on for decades, literally. Um, show, raise your hand if you've ever used that table in any way. That's a lot of people. It's a pretty important table. Um, for example, in the last talk at the end, the speaker, uh, Jen, was looking for an example of a curve to apply the algorithm to, and she mentioned searching through Kimono's tables. Um, so that table very recently reached the first curve of rank 4, which has uh, conductor 234,446. So I'm interested in creating similar tables, but over number fields, and totally real number fields are a little bit easier to deal with than some other number fields from the point of view of enumerating elliptic curves. The first totally real number field is Q, the rational numbers, but um, John has already done a great job making enormous tables there. The next totally real number field after the rational numbers is Q adjoined square root of 5, if you order them by um, discriminant. And I'll focus the rest of this discussion and talk on um, creating a similar table to what Kimono's created, but over F, which is Q root 5, for the rest of the talk. There's always a reminder at the bottom of the slide what F is. Um, quick thanks. So there are many people that have been involved in this project. The names underlined are at least in this room. Um, and also thanks to the organizers of AMS for organizing ants. So the talk will break into three pieces. I'll show you some data about uh, all the curves up to norm conductor 1831. So that's the first case of a rank 2 curve. So I have lots of statistics there since we systematically computed everything up to that point last summer. Um, then I'll talk a little bit more about how you find all the elliptic curves uh, attached to a given new form. So you're given a rational Hilbert modular new form of weight 2, 2, there is a collection of isogenous elliptic curves that are associated to it. So I'll discuss how that works. And then finally, I'll talk about how to systematically find rational new forms. Um, it's interesting because the algorithms are almost uniformly different than the algorithms that Cremona uses for enumerating elliptic curves over Q. And the complexity issues are very different as well. For him, certain matrices are less sparse, and for me, they're more sparse. For him, there's a systematic way of just sort of writing down the wire stress equation where you have a good handle on how long it will take. Um, for me, you have to use other methods, etc. So things are very complementary, surprisingly so. So first, tables. Um, I'm going to show you a table. You might mistake it for Kimono's tables initially. Uh, at that speed, it probably looks like Cremona's book. But, yeah, there, there's a bunch of fives. Notice the equations listed at the beginning have phi. Phi is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, the golden ratio. And notice the table also starts at 31 rather than 11. The first um, conductor of an elliptic curve over Q root 5 is an ideal in Q root 5. It's the ideal generated by 31 and 12 plus phi. It has norm 31. It's one of the split primes over 31. And uh, here we have a new, we, the point of this table is partly to show you that uh, we found every single elliptic curve, not just one curve in each isogeny class or something, um, but every single curve in the isogeny class and also computed kind of all the other information that goes into the BSD conjecture and so on about these curves. Yes? And also to plot, so to plot the curves by the compass conjugate pairs. Ah, so they're not actually. Um, notice here, for example, 31A and 31B are conjugate ideals, but we're listing them separately. For quite a while in this project, we would only include one each of the two conjugate curves, and this caused confusion. Uh, we found that just including both of them and then doing double checks later to make sure that you get consistent information caused less confusion. So in all cases, for every statistic I give you today, everything I talk about, I'm going to not use the fact that, uh, that whenever you have an elliptic curve over Q root 5, you can hit it by an automorphism and you get another elliptic curve over Q root 5. They need not be isomorphic. They're different curves. 
but um, there's an easy way to get from one to, in, in most cases, another. Um, I will not be modding out by that equivalence relation in everything that I do. Yes? Another question. Um, so, under what conditions did you include L2 curves that you find over Q? We just included them if they're up to the norm bound. So, for example, there's a curve over Q of conductor 11. Its conductor over Q root 5 is, is uh, 11 still, actually, but its norm is uh, 121. And this label, that's the norm of the conductor. So this is your familiar curve of conductor 11. So if it's there, it's there. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so this table goes up to 1831. So if we go down again all the way to the bottom, boom, uh, you'll see that there's a curve. Notice the rank column has a 2 in it. That's why we stopped at this point rather than somewhere else. Yes, Kiran. So what's the maximum size of an isogeny class in this? That's a good question. There are all kinds of statistical questions you might ask. And I will put up some tables. And also emphasize the remark that recently came up. Uh, we do include both E and E sigma. So um, here's a table that counts. I'll get to your question in a second. But here's a table that counts the uh, number of isogeny classes that we found and the number of isomorphism classes as a function of the uh, conductor. So at the end of the day, we found 3,368 curves. So if you printed out this table and made a book out of it, it would look very similar in thickness to the tables part of John Kermona's book. Um, we also found 1,414 isogeny classes. And you might wonder, what are the sizes of the isogeny classes we found? So here they are. Um, look at the bottom line. Uh, there are 498 curves that are isolated in their isogeny class. And there's three curves where the isogeny class has cardinality 10, which um, if you've looked at Carvinus tables a lot, you probably haven't seen any isogeny classes of cardinality 10. Because over Q, the cardinality is in this eight. But over Q root 5, you have some bigger isogeny classes. Yes? So my question was actually, is that 10 uh, known to be optimal? I don't know it to be optimal, but I suspect it to be optimal. Yes? Why is 3 so much? I don't know. Very <laughs> That concerned me greatly. <laughs> I, I looked at that and was disturbed as well. Um, There's another table. Oh, do you have a comment about 3? Or something else? Well, like that 3, I think, can have a curve that has 2 3 assigned to or 2 5 assigned to Right. And that's much harder than even you know, X model 3, which is really true. And even if you have a curve with complete clever suit structure, that already gives you four curves before it's actually easier to get into that. That was a good answer. Uh, <laughs> here's another table. You might wonder how many curves have a two isogeny. Not saying that that's their only isogeny, but there are uh, 2,298 such curves um, and 652 such isogeny classes. Uh, for some isogeny, there were 38 such curves. Remember, these are only the curves that we found in our tables up to 1831. For example, the modular curve X017, um, or which is the same as the elliptic curve 17A, it has, if you take its quadratic twist over by 5, it has rank 1. Therefore, over the field Q root 5, the genus 1 curve X017 has rank 1 which means that there are lots of 17 isogenies. There are lots of elliptic curves with the 17 isogeny. You don't see this over Q, but you do see it over Q root 5. However, you don't see it in our tables, at least these tables. What? You see one over Q root 5. OK. Yeah, you don't see infinitely many. Let me emphasize that. Here you, here you would see them infinitely often. You have a nice parameterization. Thanks. Here's something you don't see at all. So, um, this is a table of the number of times in our tables that we saw each torsion subgroup. So, for example, Z mod 2Z happened 1,453 times. Um, much less frequent is, for example, Z mod, uh, I can hardly read it at an angle, but you can see it's somewhere less frequent. One that's, and, and the second column has the same data, but over the rational numbers for curves defined over Q. So for example, Z mod 2Z again is more popular than anything else over Q. But here's an interesting line. Z mod 15Z 
This doesn't happen over Q, but it does happen over Q root 5, exactly once. So, and this, this is the only example over Q root 5. Is that is it because it's the only example of your conductor, or is it no. the only example? No, it is the only example. There's exactly one curve like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Shapiro H take groups. One point of this table is to emphasize that we computed all the invariants of all these curves, multiplied them together, and eventually managed to get numbers that were perfect squares, rather than numbers like 7 eighths and so on at the beginning. Um, in fact, uh, Ashwath, are you here? Right there, he, did, he made this table. Uh, he's an undergrad at Princeton. And um, you can see, for example, there are 3,191 curves that have trivial shot in their table. Um, there were two curves that have shot order 36, um, et cetera. These are the conjectural orders of shot. We did check in exactly one case that shot had the conjectural order, namely the very first curve does really have shot order one. Um, you have to apply work of Xiaomu Zhang, um, computation with Hegner points, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty elaborate, but it's possible in particular cases, to verify that Shaw has a conjectural order. And that's been done once. So if you want to find an example of an elliptic curve over Q root 5 with non-trivial Shaw, systematically, you can look in our tables and find all of them up to this bound. This might be useful for something. OK, now I'm going to talk about how we uh, made this table. It's really giving you a glimpse, but hopefully a useful one. So first, we're going to. Um, I haven't said it explicitly, but we'll, we're assuming modularity. There is a standard modularity conjecture, namely that L functions of rational, cuspidal, Hilbert modular forms of parallel weight 2 and level n. Um, those L functions are the same as the L functions of elliptic curves over Q root 5. And you might think modularity is proved if you're not a modularity expert, but um, modularity is proved often in a lot of situations. Uh, for example, as came up in um, Winnie Lee's talk, modularity, or Serre's conjecture is known over Q. But if you go to other fields, if you consider Galois representations where your base field isn't Q, uh, even for GL2, we don't know the modularity conjecture in total generality. Um, but I talked with Richard Taylor a while about this particular case, and under certain hypotheses, restrictive hypotheses, namely the restriction of the Galois representation to a certain subfield is absolutely irreducible, you do know via recent work of um, Toby G and Mark Kisson that uh, these things are, uh, this conjecture is true. So in certain situations it's true, but in general we don't know this conjecture. I will assume this conjecture everywhere for the rest of our discussion, um, implicitly or explicitly, but it's not a theorem right now. Just like Cremona decided to continue making tables of elliptic curves and throw the word modular into as an adjective and everything he did, um, I'm not going to be dissuaded by the fact that this isn't a theorem. Did Taylor have any, any thoughts about how close we are to proving yes. this in 4 over Q squared 5, say? I think so. Uh, it's, Q root 5 is somehow one of the hardest of the real quadratic fields to deal with for various reasons involving 5. Um, so he did have quite a bit of thoughts about that, but I don't want to go into detail here. Um, but. There's some things that may be harder because modular curves have genus 1 instead of 0 or something. OK, so uh, just a quick remark. I don't want to dwell on this slide very much. But if you assume the modularity conjecture, then it is at least possible to enumerate all the elliptic curves over Q root 5 of conductor n. just want to point that out. It's an algorithmically doable problem. It might take a very long time. Um, and this is just a, I mean, the reason is that you can list all the Hilbert modular forms. There's an algorithm to do that, which I'll talk about in a moment. And once you've done that, then you know how many coefficients are needed to determine an L series of that conductor. And then what you do is you just enumerate get any stupid method you can think of, the countably many elliptic curves over our base field F. And at some point, you will eventually hit the right curve. And you can verify that because you can compute the conductor of your curve. It's completely stupid, so if this doesn't make sense to you. Don't worry about it. It's just the most stupid argument you can think of. Um, the point is, if somebody says they have an algorithm for computing uh, an elliptic curve attached to Hilbert modular form, then the real content is in how fast it is, not in just having one, or in whether they're assuming modularity. Okay. Um, so here are a couple of ideas for how to more efficiently find 
the ellip an elliptic curve associated to a modular form. So uh, in the case of the rational numbers in Cremona's situation, he finds a classical modular form, and then he computes period intervals. He just integrates a couple, he integrates two modular symbols, or maybe uh, one modular symbol, and uses a little trickery, and just finds the period lattice of the elliptic curve, and from that uses the Weierstrass um, G functions, and just gets a, a Weierstrass equation, and then checks that, in fact, gave you, gave you that curve. You can't do that here. Um, modular symbols are these paths between cusps, and there aren't any cusps. So game over with that approach. But there are many other things you can try to do. So you have a Hilbert modular form in your hands. What that means is you've done some calculations, some linear algebra, and you know the number of points on your elliptic curve mod any prime you like. And it's reasonably efficient to compute, say, the number for all the primes of norm conductor up to uh, 5,000 or something like that. That's doable. So you, you know how many points are mod 2, mod 3, and so on. So some things you can try are you can uh, enumerate elliptic curves for, with a given AP. If you specify that a couple of AP have to have these values, then you can uh, do a sort of Chinese intermediate theorem lift and just do a, a search. And uh, in fact, very often you'll find your curve pretty quickly, as long as the equations aren't too big. Um, you can search, if you uh, know the AP, then you can compute the norm of P plus 1 minus AP, and those numbers will give you a really good sense of whether or not some other number L divides the cardinality of the torsion subgroup. You can tell whether or not your curve is likely to have a point of order L, and then you can do a search in the family of all curves with a point of order L. So if you know your curve has a seven torsion point, just start listing curves with seven torsion, and you might run into your curve. Um, uh, there are other tricks. For example, Tom Fisher has this nice idea. If you know one curve and you know another curve is congruent to it, you can list all these other curves. You can list all the curves that are congruent to one curve. So we found we use this to find one particularly hard to find curve. Um, if you have a curve, it might be a twist of something of lower conductor. So uh, try that. Uh, Cremona lingam. So if you since you know the conductor of your curve, you don't know the curve, but you know the conductor of the curve. One way to try to find the curve would be to find all the curves of that conductor or just find lots of curves of that conductor. And uh, Cremona has some code for doing that um, by finding S integral points on auxiliary curves. And that's pretty useful in some cases. So the number of, what it really does is it finds all curves with conductor divisible by a certain list of primes. And uh, there could be a lot of curves with conductor divisible by the same primes as your conductor. So it spits out you know, potentially thousands of curves. And they might not have anything to do with the curve you're looking for. Uh, there's another trick which looks, at least at first glance, most similar to Cre what Cremona does, but uh, Lassina Dembele has a nice paper where he explains how to consider special values of L functions attached to your modular form, and things are really weird because you're over a uh, quadratic extension, but using those you can sort of, with enough luck in looking at uh, not just the L function, but its quadratic twists by Hecke characters, you can hopefully, if you assume various conjectures and compute to enough precision, figure out what the period lattice is, up to isogeny at least. And this, in fact, can be made to work in some cases. It's pretty inefficient, but it does work, or it has, we used it in some very hard cases. So, um, for example, John Bober spent quite a while implementing this last summer. So there's an implementation. And Noam has an idea that involves using the uh, lambda invariant, which I think Steve Donnelly and John Voigt used to great effect to make a similar table to what we have here. And uh, as extra confidence in our um, list of elliptic curves, I think they found the same number of curves. So they found the same actual Weierstrass equations. So despite there being numerous different approaches to finding E, there's no analog of what Cremona does. Over Q root 5. Uh, one other uh, quick comment. So if you have one elliptic curve, you finally found the elliptic curve attached to a modular form, you need to find all the other ones. So what Cremona does over Q is he uses Mazur's theorem. He knows a bound on the degrees of the isogenies that you might have. It's completely unnecessary, in fact, as it turns out. There's a recent paper of Bill Array in which he gives an algorithm to compute a finite set of primes. It takes as input an elliptic curve over a number field, any number field, and it outputs a finite set of primes. And that set of primes is a superset of the primes of, for which you can have an isogeny. And so you just use Bailey's formulas, his algorithm, and it's actually... Uh, much simpler in the case of a quadratic field. So, um, so you have that. So in fact, you can enumerate, given an elliptic curve of a number field, you can enumerate provably the whole isogeny class without needing any theorem like Mazur's, which is really, really good to know. 
Okay, finally, finding new forms. Here's uh, Lucina Dembele's thesis in one slide. Um, the long and short of it is you do arithmetic involving the uh, Hamilton, the classical Hamilton quaternion algebra, but where your base field is q adjoint square root of 5. What you do is you want to find all the elliptic curves, or actually here you want to find all the rational new forms of conductor n. So you consider, let r be the ring of integers of f, z adjoining 1 plus root 5 over 2. You consider p1 of r mod n, just this finite set. There's an action of the um, Icosian group of order of 120 on this finite set. You mod out by the action of that group. You get a smaller finite set. You take the finite dimensional complex vector space on that set, and there's an action of tack operators on there. That gives you uh, some <coughs> linear algebra object, and then doing sparse linear algebra, you can find rational eigenvectors. And these rational eigenvectors give you all the Hilbert modular cost forms of level n. Yeah, the jockey language correspondence. Okay. So, um, just some remarks about this. It's extremely important that you can compute with P1 of R mod N very, very efficiently to make this a good algorithm. Uh, so, for example, if what you want to do is you want to factor N as a product of primes and represent your elements by tuples of its. That representation is really good for this because you end up spending a lot of time enumerating the elements of P1. And it's way easier to enumerate elements of P1 of R mod of prime power than P1 of R mod N. And so you just actually keep everything in that form. And every operation you need to do, you can do in that form. And so it's very, very fast. Um, big red, very fast. And just to give you a sense, if you put a, a level in that has norm, you know, 200, roughly around 200,000, it gives you presentation for the space and a heck operator in a matter of seconds. Very few seconds. So this is implemented um, and very fast. And the matrices that you get are extremely sparse. So the heck operator T sub 2 has five non-zero entries per row. So it's a really nice sparse matrix. OK, so now uh, my last slide. So the current work that is ongoing in this project is, well, there's a natural goal to catch up with Cremona, namely, let's find all the elliptic curves up to the first curve of rank 4. This might be this curve that Noam found which has norm conductor 1.2 million. But it might be an earlier curve. It would be very exciting if it were. Um, we don't know yet. But uh, here's the situation. First, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Sebastian Pankritz and I spent a lot of time, uh, well, I guess it wasn't that much time, like a day or two, on making mod p sparse linear algebra very, very fast in SAGE. And we're um, uh, it's much faster even than Cremona's sparse linear algebra because uh, the core ends up depending on doing dense Gaussian elimination and it uses Linbox for that. And Linbox has a really fast implementation of dense Gauss elimination over finite fields. So that's what we really depend on. Um, we did an estimate of how long it should take to find all the rational new forms up to norm conductor 1.2 million and find the Heck eigenvalues A sub P for the norm up to 4,000. Use that to find the analytic rank and not find the actual equations of the curves. Um, and that came out to maybe roughly 200,000 hours, which sounds like a long time, um, but it's not really that long. So, um, and just to give you a sense, I started this running on I think, something like 12 cores two weeks ago, and, and it got 83% of the levels up to norm conductor 252,000. So we have a lot of them now. Um, that's just finding the rational new forms, not all of the heck eigenvalues. But computing the rational new forms involves, it's really dominated by one, um, by like 10 sparse linear algebra kernels. That's really the hard part, mod p. Okay, so uh, that's the goal. I don't know when it will finish. I hope it takes less than two decades, which is roughly how long Promon has been taking to do the analogous goal. Thank you very much. So just a few websites of relevance, all easily that you can all, that you can easily get from my website, wstein.org/talks. 
at the top you have the talk I just gave, um, slash papers has papers that I've written, and one of them is this paper, and you can see that there's a GitHub repository, and that has, if you look inside the GitHub repository, you can find the file that I was scrolling through in the tables directory. However, uh, so there's a PDF in here called table.pdf, and that's the file I was scrolling through. Watch out though, we recently discovered a, I don't know, a week or two ago that some of the other files that end in .txt are inconsistent. Um, the data in the PDF and one of these files is right, and some of the other files were early versions of files that we were using to put together the final version of the paper. So, um, so the short of it is wstein.org slash papers, and then look in the natural way, but caveat about the GitHub repository not being perfect. Yet. Uh, nope. Okay, the first rank 3.1 is going to have norm, norm, not gnome, conductor, um, less than or equal to 163 squared. So gnome found this curve, which over Q has rank, I think, 2, but it's quadratic twist has rank 1, and when you add in, okay, has rank 1. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's a curve of conductor 163 over Q has rank 1 when you think it's quadratic twist. By 5, you get a curve of rank 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. So, um, yeah, I think we estimated that it should take about 24 hours to do all the calculations to get the analytic ranks up to this point. However, we haven't fully implemented everything. Only So, for example, the rational eigenvector stuff is implemented. That's why we're running it. There's some issues. Not easy. There's always issues with this sort of thing. Yes? Um, a couple of slides back, you had one remark where you said the DNA is better than one of the symbols. Linear algebra, yes. The matrices that you get out of this have five non zero entries per row, or at least for the heck operator T2, which you'd use when 2 is a prime of good reduction, and 2 doesn't divide the level. Uh, when you use modular symbols, the matrices tend to be sparse, but they they can have pieces where they're a lot worse than this. Um, so T2 is over Q. It's more complicated over Q, strangely enough. Yes, there's an analog of this over Q, but then you have to use a different quaternion algebra for each level. Whereas here we have exactly one quaternion algebra. And exactly, the heck operators are just sort of one list of quaternions that we have to work with. So it's those Lacina sort of observation. They have this uniform algorithm. It's because you have the two, you know, you have to have an even number of ramified primes and over Q root 5, you can just stick them both at infinity. Whereas over Q, you have only one place at infinity, and they have to use another one. So you have to use different between all this. But this approach has been used by people over the years for computing elliptic curves over Q. Grant logic, grant matrices is the keyword. Any other questions? Obviously, there. So, okay, thanks. Thank you.